We have enough room for everybody who is sitting on the floor to be sitting on a chair as well. You want to sit on the chair? Comfortable chairs. Is it alright to sit up in the middle there? Yeah, it's the picture we have you against the wall on the other side. Oh, yeah, sorry. The one I've got off too is. Uh, ah. You should have given it to me. Yeah. to uh, introduce you now to Jonathan Nader. Uh, Jonathan is a free software user who first came to our attention at Infocent about two years ago. He uh, randomly uh, called me up one day and explained the situation, let's come visit the Infocent and come and talk to us about some stuff. And at the end of the phone call he said, oh, and by the way, I'm blind. I'm going to need someone to help me get from the train station because someone can't pick me up. Uh, and then I routinely forgot about this, and yeah. then uh, got a phone call, and someone was like, there's a guy Jonathan here to see you, and Brent's going to go and get him from the train station, and you should get to the office right now. And uh, since then, we've seen a lot of Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, he was an intern for us, for a summer, uh, working with Bob Cole on a whole bunch of uh, different things, uh, including making Triscale uh, Vanilla Linux uh, accessible from the installation point of view. Uh, Jonathan is also the founder and executive director of the Accessible Computing Foundation, a new organization that he is starting to work on these issues in free software. So I'm very pleased to welcome you, Jonathan Nader. Thank, thank you all for coming. I apologize up front for not having any slides. I'm sure you wouldn't appreciate my artistic ability to put together slides, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, I, but first off, I'd like to thank uh, the Libre Planet and Matt and Josh and everyone else that put on this event. And, uh, I know what kind of effort it takes to do this. We just did the Northeast Canoe Linux Fest last weekend in Worcester, and I have to say I much rather would ha come to an event and show up and give a talk than put one on. And I just want to say thanks to everyone that put this on. It was a great success and a great event to come to, and I'd like to say it's an honor and privilege to be speaking here today, and I, I thank you for the opportunity. Um, my talk is going to be about free software and accessibility. I know we, we heard Karen and Joe Marie talk about Orca and GNOME specifically, but my talk is going to be on the more broader aspect of free software and accessibility. Uh, I will hit on some points that they spoke about and uh, maybe give a little more detail and explanation on some of these things. Um, the first thing I'd like to uh, say, uh, my talk I'll start off giving you a little bit of background information about myself. I'll talk quickly about proprietary assistive technology and, and then I will get into the importance of free software and assistive technology and accessibility. Um, also, um, if anyone has any questions, uh, please ask at any point in time. Unfortunately, if you raise your hand, that won't be effective on me, but uh, I'm sure we can figure something out, maybe throw something at me or someone can interrupt in some way, shape or form. 
Um, so, my name is Jonathan Nato. I am a father. I have three children. I have two sons and a daughter. I am, have been married for going on 11 years, and I'm a blind GNU Linux user, and a free, I'm a free software advocate, and uh, accessibility. So, um, let's see. So I, I'm the host of a few podcasts on frostbitemedia.org. We uh, basically on these podcasts, I interview project leaders of uh, GNU Linux distributions and free software, and try to promote their platform or distribution, uh, doing various interviews. Um, so since I'm the host of uh, these podcasts, opening the dialogue during this talk would be a little more comfortable for myself. So again, if anyone has any questions during the talk, please don't be afraid to, uh, to pipe in. And as Matt mentioned at the beginning, I'm also the Executive Director of the Accessible Computing Foundation. And we will learn a little bit more about that towards the end of the talk and we'll get to more details of exactly what the focus is of the foundation. So some of you may or may not know, I wasn't born blind. I was in a car accident at the age of 14. I was a freshman in high school. Um, it was obviously a pretty tragic car accident. Um, I should have lost my life in that accident, but all I lost was my life, and here I am giving this talk to you today. Uh, before my car accident, I never ex uh, considered accessibility. I, I myself didn't depend on accessibility before the car accident. I was a normal kid playing sports. I could had 20/20 vision, and uh, I had never suffered any type of injury up until the car accident. So when I talk to some people about accessibility and bring awareness to it, sometimes people like will tell me, oh, "I feel so guilty. I never thought of these things before." And you shouldn't feel guilty because if you don't depend on these things, there's not really a reason for you to think of it, and as you know, we all live our, our lives day to day, there's no reason for, pe for accessibility to come to the forefront of your thinking, which is why I'm here, is to bring awareness to accessibility and bring it to the forefront of your, fight, of your thinking when either developing applications, putting together a GNU Linux distribution, and even designing web applications, and so on and so forth. So what, what is accessibility? What's accessible software? What can it do for people that can't access a computer like a, a normal person can that doesn't have any disabilities? Well, we heard from uh, Karen and Joe Marie earlier about the Orca screen reader, which is what I'm using right now, and why I'm wearing a headphone to hear Orca talking to me as I go through my notes. Now, what the Orca screen reader does is it lets me maneuver the GNOME desktop. I can use the tab key and the arrow keys. I can get to the menu, and I can arrow through applications, or I can hit Alt-F2 to bring up the Run dialog box and just fire off applications from there. Um, I can also enter into the terminal and do various things that I need to do from there. If I can do something on the terminal, I will pretty much default to that because it's much quicker, much easier, and I, you know, not rely on the uh, on the GUI. But um, so we're going to get into some other um, examples of what accessible software is. So there's one program called Dasher. This is an on-screen keyboard. This works great for people that have. Um, um, uh, mobility skills where maybe their hands don't work as well as they should and they can access the on-screen keyboard with a mouse and they can basically drag the mouse over the letters and click on the letters to then type out things that they need with the on-screen keyboard this gives better access to someone with low mobility mobility skills that have a problem accessing the keyboard um, this I believe is built into the good own desktop also and but it's not installed by default I don't think I have yet to see it on pretty much any distribution with install by default, but it is available. Um, another great accessible piece of software, which is really interesting, and someone actually asked a question earlier during Karen and Joe Marie's talk, was um, accessing the computer if you have no control over maybe your arms and legs, and even maybe if you can't even speak. There's a great program called Mousetrap. What this allows you to do is plug in a common webcam and what it will do is it will do eye tracking. So the webcam will be able to track your eyes and as the user is moving his eyes across the screen, the mouse cursor will be moving. And with mouse trap, you can set the time. Uh, once you stop the cursor, you can say, after three seconds of it not moving, I want you to open up the program. So once the user stops moving the cursor on a particular icon or program, it'll then open that item and then the user can continue to uh, maneuver through the desktop and have access to their computer. 
I'm not 100% sure how far along this project is. I have just discovered somewhat recently and I've been looking into it, but it does seem to be working. I'm not sure exactly how well it works, but I just wanted to let everyone out there know that this software does exist. Um, another great project is called Simon. This is voice recognition software. Um, it is not part of the GNOME desktop, it's built into KDE, but you can install it on GNOME. I'm not, again, not sure how well this works, but there are, in the latest release of KDE 4.7 and 4.8, if you use Simon, I, it automatically works with a chess game that's built into the KDE desktop, and you can actually play the game of chess just by using your voice. So hopefully uh, there will be more expansion done to Simon to could start controlling the desktop through voice recognition and not just you know being able to play chess. I know the the KDE accessibility team is uh, you know continuing to work on something like this. So there's uh, some very exciting progress with that going on. Also, shoot, there's a question for me actually. Um, is is Simon based on um, Carnegie Mellon's uh, Sphinx work? Do you know? I think it is. A while back? I think it is. That's great. And and so if you're if, if, if there's a lot of stuff for Sphinx, which ironically isn't <laughs> very accessible to get going and using, um, and, and anybody who's interested in this, even uh, going through what is available that's free software from that, um, adding that to the free software directory would be a huge help uh, for, for us uh, tracking down more of those Sphinx-related things, by the way, just a aside. There's uh, also another voice recognition software. Unfortunately, I'm not sure if this project is still developing. Um, I, I had seen videos and it was quite impressive to where they were at. It's called Vedix. It's V-E-D-I-C-S. And this was working with GNOME 2, so I'd imagine there might be, need to be some uh, work done to work with GNOME 3. But um, there were videos where the developers could say, menu and then it would bring them to where applications was and places and, you know, internet. And they could say office, and then they would say open office writer. And it would open it up and they could start, you know, speaking uh, text and creating a document. They could even go as far as to opening music files, stopping, fast forwarding music files. They could open up Firefox, get online, and move to particular links within the web page, all through voice recognition. Uh, again, um, not 100% sure what this project is right now, but it was pretty far along, and it seemed to work rather well with the videos that I, that I had watched, that I've seen. So that's another promising uh, project for uh, free software and accessibility. So uh, before we get to the importance of uh, free software, and, and I forgot to mention earlier that Matthew Garrett said a fantastic thing during his talk that free software isn't just for a set uh, certain people. It's for everyone, and which it, it just struck a chord in my heart. And it, it's very true. Free software can impact uh, a very large amount of people that depend on accessibility. And again, this is why I'm here to bring awareness to it. And this is the point of the Accessible Community Foundation. And we'll we'll get more into that. But to to give you a little background on you know why you, you'll see why free software is important to accessibility. I'm going to give you a quick rundown of of uh, proprietary assistive technology, which I have, unfortunately, a little experience in it um, before I discovered free software. Um, there's a screen reader called JAWS, which is essentially the standard that has been set for screen reading technology for blind users. And um, anytime you see a study of uh, blind people uh, you, you know, doing accessibility tests, they're always using JAWS. Anytime uh, someone mentioned, uh, makes a suggestion for software to be uh, paid for, for assistive technology, it's, it's JAWS. So it's kind of the, the standard right now, so I'm going to just stick with uh, uh, talking about JAWS uh, in these next few moments. Now, JAWS, which is interesting, this, uh, and Joe Marie uh, alluded to this, I think, or it was Karen, I can't remember, but JAWS costs roughly $1,200. And the price of this uh, software is interesting because you figure the creators of the JAWS software would have done a little bit of homework and studied the market of people they were trying to go after to sell this software to. And if they would have done even a little bit of homework, they would have discovered roughly 70 to 80% of blind people in the United States are unemployed. 
How they reached a $1,200 price point is quite interesting. And I think there's a good reason why they did reach this price point is because our government will subsidize the cost for blind users. They will pay this $1,200 license and give it to a blind user that needs this assistive technology. Now there's certain qualifications that you need to meet in order to get this software purchased for yourself. You either have to be a student or you have to have a job which would require you to have this screen reader technology. And again, if 70 to 80 percent of people are unemployed, there's a good chance you're, you, know, you only need it if you're a student. Um, And, and outside of the United States, um, there's 360 million blind people in the world. 90% of those blind people are in developing countries. So they're obviously not going to be able to afford this, not this proprietary software also. Now, if I don't meet this qualification, that means that I can't access my computer. Now let's just take a moment and just imagine, and Karen alluded to this also, that just think for a moment, just you're on your daily routines. You send out emails, you instant message, you do whatever else you do with the computer. You go online, you do research, you read the news. And jo, jo Marie said that she uses technology for everything short of sleeping and, and, uh, and showering. So now let's just imagine for one day, you couldn't access any of these things. You could not access the technology you take for granted every day. How productive would your day be? What would you get done? Now, let's look back to my friend here who doesn't qualify to get assistive technology. He's not gonna be able to do any of those things until he finds a way to get his computer to talk to him. Now, let's say that I do qualify and I am able to get this license paid for me for free. I think to myself, that's great. I just got this this software for free as in cost, uh, gratis. And, but there comes a lot of restrictions and, I, and all of my freedoms are taken away from me. Like freedom number two, I'm not allowed to share this software with my neighbor. I could qualify and get this software and then my blind friend will say, hey, that's great news. Can you help me too? I'd love to be able to use my computer. I'd love to be able to send emails and talk with people all around the world and communicate and, and be productive like a normal person can that can see their screen. And I have to tell him, I'm sorry, I can't share this with you. I, I have to rob my friend of, of freedom, of accessing, of accessing technology. And I have to tell him, I cannot do that for you. I cannot share this software, I'm sorry, but this is mine, and I'll, and I'll, I'll send emails out for you and, and read you to them and, and, and tell you, you know, what your friends have been saying and stuff. So you are robbed of freedom too. Freedom zero, you are also robbed of with this software. They tell you how many times you can install this software. They give you three licenses for $1,200. So when you first install it, now you're down to two licenses. Since you're running on this proprietary operating system, we all know that you're going to run into problems and you're gonna to have to format your computer. And then you're gonna to have to use yet another license. And then once your third license is up, you are no longer able to install the software on your computer. Now, don't get me wrong, cost isn't the main focus here. There is a free screen reader called NVDA, and it actually is free, it's released under the GPL V2, which is a good thing. But the problem is this GPL V2 software is running on a non-free system. Even though you have control over the screen reader, you do not have control over the operating system that it's running on. So the, creator, the, the people that have developed NVDA are at the whims of this proprietary operating system. If they decide to change something, it'll break something and they'll have to figure out a way to get around it. There are a lot of JAWS users that actually use NVDA and JAWS at the same time because neither one of them can do everything perfectly. So they, they rely on both of them. Um, so, so even though this NVDA is free software, is released under the GPL v2, this is a good thing. But it's unacceptable that it's running on a proprietary operating system. Really, the end goal that I would love to see is people that depend on assistive technology is to be running a GNU Linux operating system and running completely free accessible software. That way, we don't need to be trapped under these people that develop this assistive technology and tell us how we can use it, when we can use it, um, if we report bugs, they can say, uh, well, we don't think that's important enough. Even though they don't depend on assistive technology, they don't understand what needs to be done and what doesn't need to be done. 
and they might say, well, we'll fix that, and you can get it in the, in the next upgrade, and you know, you'll have to purchase the upgrade to get that fixed. So this is why free software is so important to accessible software and assistive technology, is to the people that depend on assistive technology is to give them control back of their computers, give them control back of the software that they're using, and, free, and give them freedom and liberty over the software that they depend on on a day-to-day -day basis. This world, this day and age, technology moves at such a rapid rate, and the faster technology moves, the faster accessibility is left behind. And with free software, we can at least try and keep up with the rapid rate of the technology that's moving. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. <laughs> so why is, why is free software so important to accessibility and assistive technology? Well, the obvious answer is because of the four freedoms that we get from free software. And I know all of us know what the four freedoms are, but I'd like to present these four freedoms to you with an accessibility uh, point of view at these four freedoms and maybe you'll understand a little bit more of why free software is that important to uh, accessibility. So freedom two, I can, I can help my neighbor. Back to my example of my friend earlier, where he didn't qualify to get the proprietary assistive technology, I can easily burn a copy of Triscale GNU Linux and hand it to my friend, either put on a USB key or burn on a CD and say, here friend, you can now access your computer. You can now surf the internet. You can now send email. You can now instant message. All of this because of free software. And then he might have three or four blind friends that he can hand it to, and they in turn, and so on and so forth. So the freedom to, to share with my neighbor is a great freedom for people that depend on assistive technology and accessible software. Freedom zero is having control over your computer and being able to run the program as you want. Uh, back to my earlier example with JAWS, like I said, they limit you to three installs. With Triskel, for instance, GNU Linux, we, I could have 5,000 computers and install them as many times as I want. I could have um, organizations that are built around helping out people with disabilities and, and, and with computer labs and install all their computers with Triskel GNU Linux. And also with being able to run uh, the programs as you wish, there are actually some uh, low vision users that actually use Compiz Fusion. There's a magnification plugin into that, and they actually will use that to magnify their screen so they can enlarge the text to, um, to see the screen better. Even though Compiz Fusion didn't have this in mind when they created it, uh, blind uh, low vision users take advantage of this opportunity, and uh, this is yet another uh, great reason of being able to run the software as you wish. Freedom Zero isn't enough to run, uh, to, to gain complete control over your computer and run the software as you wish. You also need Freedom One, being able to access the source code, read it, and understand how it works. Even if uh, you yourself do not understand how to read source code or even understand a programming language, it is still important to have this freedom. Having this freedom doesn't mean you need to, to read it, doesn't mean you need to understand it, but having this freedom does mean that you can contact someone that does understand it or, do, or can read it to you and explain it to you, and then you yourself can start to understand how assistive technology works. Maybe you could even start to study the code and learn how to program yourself. Uh, obviously, blind uh, people aren't going to be reading textbooks anytime soon, so they could actually download the source code and start going through it and seeing exactly how the how uh, programming works, and then they, in turn, themselves could become programmers and employ themselves and even make modifications to Orca, start uh, new assistive technology uh, software programs, uh, helping out Triskel GNU Linux, helping out other GNU Linux distributions becoming accessible. Uh, this is a great freedom is one, is to be able to look at that source code. This will also, giving them this freedom to be able to look at the source code and or having someone explain to them what this source code means, this will encourage them having control over the software that they're using. They will then be able to understand that they can make an impact 
with the software that they're using, they can actually engage the community and file bug reports and hop on mailing lists and let people know what's working, what isn't working. But even if they can't uh, contribute to these uh, programs and, and the software with uh, programming or maybe filing bug reports, they could even join an organization and the organization can then in turn take take the donations or the membership fees and then create accessible software. That's where the Accessible Computing, Computing Foundation comes into play and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But Also, a, a great example of being able to modify the code, I'm sure all of us have heard about Tux Paint. There was a mother that had a child with autism and he loved to use Tux Paint and he would draw something on the screen and he'd click on the print button and run to the printer and grab the paper. Unfortunately, uh, her son was clicking print and run to the printer more than he was modifying what he was doing on the screen with Tux Paint. So she reached out to the developer and explained to him her situation and you know she, she, she explained how she was going through uh, printer uh, cartridges quickly and she wanted to know if there was something she could do about it. And the great thing that the developer did, which I thought was brilliant, is he put it like a time, like a, a time stamp or a timer on the print function. So if her son clicked print and the, the printer would print out the page, he would have to wait at least three minutes before he could print it again. So even if he clicked print, 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 nothing would happen until the three minutes was up. Then once he clicked print, it would then print the page again. And that's just another great example of being able to help out someone with that. Even if it's a tiny accessibility issue, it's just great to be able to have control like that over the software, being able to contact the developers to make such a change like that. And uh, it's just another great thing about the free software community. Now, freedom three is being able to distribute modified code. And Ruben Rodriguez is the perfect example for this. And I, I hope I don't embarrass you in these next few minutes, Ruben, but um, as Matt uh, mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I interned at the FSF over the summer and I, I reached out to Ruben Rodriguez and I, I pointed out to him that the installer that Triskel GNU Linux was using had an accessibility functionality in it, but it was very hard to get to, and it was very hard to even understand how to, how to activate this accessibility function. And so when talking with Ruben, uh, even during our talks, he, he, he himself also apologized for you know, not considering accessibility, which again, you know, it's, it's not of anyone's fault if you don't depend on it. It's easy not to think about it. But the way, once it was brought to Rupert's attention, and the way that he's been working like with us, and he's been able to talk with Joe Marie now, he's been a perfect example of how uh, developers should react when accessibility needs are brought to their attention. Now, we're working with Ruben, he designed a perfect way for Triskel GNU Linux to become accessible, but without being annoying to someone that doesn't depend on accessibility. Now, what happened is he, uh, the installer had an accessibility function in it, like I said, but it was hard to access. So what Ruben did is, when you put in the Triskel uh, GNU Linux CD, or if you're booting off the USB, it'll come to the menu to choose your language. Now, if you choose your language, you'll go on with the installer just like you normally would. You would never know it has an accessible installer. But a blind person installing Triskel will not see the menu to choose their language. And when it sits there for roughly 30 seconds, it'll then boot into a live session with the Orca screen reader running, which allows a, a completely blind person such as myself to install Triskel by themselves with no sighted help at all whatsoever. And it's just brilliant the way Ruben implemented it because at first we were saying we were gonna like maybe make like a, an accessibility spin or or do something like that. And Ruben insisted on making the main release of Triskel having the accessible feature in it, which I thought was fantastic of him to want to do that for implementing accessibility into a mainstream release of an operating system and not just making some specialty uh, distribution for uh, blind and low vision users and or anyone else that depends on accessibility. So distributing this modified code, let's, let's take this a few steps farther to see how this will impact really the world and people with disabilities. And again, I just want to thank Ruben for this initiative and I'm looking forward to working with him uh, more in the future. Um, there are roughly one billion people in the world with some type of disability. And that's a billion with a B. So 
Out of those billion people, 300, like I said before, 360 million people are blind. Out of those 90% of blind people live in developing countries. What is great about being able to distribute this modified code is, sorry, is there a question? Oh, what, what the, the great thing about being able to distribute this modified code is we could take Triskel GNU Linux and let's say we could go to India where there's hundreds of languages. We could modify each distribution release to fit that particular community within India with their localization, with their languages, and we'd be able to affect all of the, the blind users in these developing countries. We'd be able to let them access technology that they may never have even been able to use before. Bringing this software freedom to these people with disabilities will liberate them and let them possibly even be able to get jobs now that they can use a computer. Um, maybe some of these people don't own computers and they can't, but you could install Triskel GNU Linux on a USB drive, and on a flash drive, make it a persistent install. So wherever these people go, and if they have access to a computer, they can boot off of the USB drive and then access the computer, change, you know, write up documents or go online and, and check their email, and they would be able to basically carry around the computer in their pocket. And anytime they access the computer to boot off of, they could just stick the flash drive in their computer and be able to access technology. Uh, again, free software will liberate uh, people that have disabilities that depend on this technology but can't access it. And again, their destinies will be put into their hands using free software. Where they can join communities, make a difference, they can write up documentation, they can join mailing lists, um, they can learn how to code and change the code themselves, they can make suggestions such as I did with Ruben Rodriguez, and uh, it's, just, it's a great thing to be able to, uh, to be empowered and to take control of your destiny and be able to access the technology that you once couldn't access due to uh, proprietary software and not being able to get your hands on it. Uh, well, I'm Ruben Rodriguez. And, <laughs> well, I, I stopped uh, speaking my name properly, so I, I am now say Ruben Rodriguez. Like, <laughs> but it, it sounds nice that way. Uh, I, I want to uh, do just a little, uh, say a little thing that is, uh, I feel very honored that uh, uh, you, you mentioned me that many times, and but it was very easy. It was very easy to do once you told me the, the flaws that were in Trisco, because uh, the problem wasn't that the software wasn't accessible. It was that uh, we weren't paying attention. We weren't aware that there was um, a problem that we needed to fix. And uh, there are a lot of developers, I understand, in this room. And I want uh, you all to understand this, this thing. If your program is not accessible, in most cases, that is very easy to fix. It's just a matter of uh, a set of rules and good practices, and your program will become accessible. You just need to uh, ask around a little bit, little, uh, some documentation, or in, in, in many cases, if you use the proper uh, framework, it will do almost everything for you. So you just need uh, to, to check if it is uh, accessible, if it's not changed uh, several things, uh, and it will, uh, in most cases, it will work. Uh, so uh, don't repeat my, my error of uh, getting things for granted and assuming uh, it, will, it was so difficult that it will be a very big project to make my, my program accessible, so I will not even try. Please try. You will find that in a lot of cases it's uh, really easy, and you will help a lot of people. Thanks, Ruben. Um, yeah, and that's a good point too. If you want to know if your software is accessible, you could hop on the Orca mailing list. Trust me, people will try out your software and let you know what works and what doesn't work. All it takes is just dropping in, dropping an email into the list, and everyone would be more than willing to try it out. So. If you're ever looking for testers, you definitely want to go to the Oracle mailing list. Um, so that sort of brings me to the, the, the point of the Accessible Community Foundation is... Oh, shoot, go ahead.
Uh, yeah, Allison asked the question, have I used like kind of like voice recognition software from the smartphones and see how well how well they, they react? And she also said that uh, it's kind of funny that jobs cost twelve hundred dollars and you get a cell phone for much less than that that can you know sort of accomplish the same things and I agree. Um, I can't tell you about uh, like the iPhone and Siri and all that. I refuse to purchase any product from that company. Um, <laughs> But uh, I do have an Android phone, and um, the voice recognition on that, I'll, I'll use it when I'm uh, text messaging my wife, and 99% of the time, things dead on. And it works really well with that. Um, I've sent quite a few emails trying to do it too, and it does a pretty good job at that. Um, right now, uh, the accessibility on smartphones is a, an interesting place. When the iPhone was first introduced, I said, how can you make a phone with no buttons? Like, you're completely, you know, ignoring a, a, a subset of people that will not be able to access this phone at all. And it's actually an FCC regulation for phones to be accessible to all people. And I have a feeling that um, Apple was under some heat, and they really, when they released the 3GS, they all of a sudden said, oh yeah, by the way, uh, you can, you know, this phone's accessible to blind people now. I think that's why they pushed up the 3GS the way they did is because they were starting to fall under some heat and uh, they had to do something about it. Um, uh, yeah, mobile accessibility is uh, an interesting space right now. Uh, for a while, Android was lacking big time. And even though at the time the iPhone was, I, I hated to admit it to people, but it was extremely accessible, but I still refused to get into, you know, in, in, into that environment with that company. So, uh, okay. So I, re I refuse to, uh, to, to go into that um, wall of garden, if you will. But um, the Android 4.0, the ice cream sandwich, is much better with accessibility. I'm looking forward to being able to test out ice cream sandwich on the phone at some point. I would say it's uh, comparable now with, uh, with the iPhone, which is exciting. Um, and so, and I mentioned the Accessible Computing Foundation, like this is the goal of the foundation is to bring free accessible software, not just to blind people, and I, and I know this, and I know there's, like I said, there's over one billion people in the world with some type of disability. There's learning disabilities, there's paraplegics, quadriplegics, there's, there's deaf people, there's blind people, there's, you know, all, all kinds of disabilities. And that what the foundation wants to do is to bring accessibility to technology. We want to bridge the gap between technology and accessibility and let people access this technology that's flying around them and they're, they're told daily, oh, I'm sorry, you can't use it yet. We're, we're working on it. Oh, I'm sorry, you have this problem. We're working on it. And that's what the foundation wants to do. We want to create free software, free accessible software, so that everyone can access the technology that's around them. That there's so much more that a lot of these people could be doing if they could use a computer, but, but they're inbound and not able to use a computer due to being in a developing country and you can't afford expensive software or not being able to get someone to buy it for you. And so that's the importance of free software is to bring these four freedoms to all these people with disabilities that depend on assistive technology. And so what the foundation wants to do is, is help out Orca, help out Gnome, uh, even um, help out Mousetrap and Dasher, or even Simon or Vedex, and, and help contribute to these uh, projects where, you know, really a lot of these projects are like one person doing the work on their like own free time, or it's one person like Joan Reed, you know, working on Orca, but how much more could be done if there's three, four, five, ten people working on it? So much more could be accomplished this way. And so what the foundation wants to do is to fund developers to, you know, to help out free software accessibility, to bring awareness to free software accessibility. We want to be able to go to other countries and show them that, you know, in Nepal, 99% of blind people in Nepal are unemployed. So th that's a huge market of people that we could you know, help them get computers and access these computers using free software, get them involved in the free software community. And it's just a whole another group of people that 
could uh, appreciate the benefits of free software. So that's what the Accessible Computing Foundation wants to do. These people could then become members at two dollars a month, and they can help out the foundation by being a member. And then we can employ uh, developers to add to free software, even create new free software that doesn't exist. And it won't even be limited to, to GNU Linux distributions, but whatever technology we get our hands on that we can put free software on to make it accessible, that's our end goal, is for everyone to be able to access the technology around them. And like I said, we want to bridge the gap between technology and accessibility. So that's really the focus of the, the foundation. And uh, like I said, uh, it, it's, my, it's my goal for anyone that has any type of disability to be running a, a GNU Linux distribution and running free software on that and have complete control over their computer, over their operating system, over their assistive technology, and to be control of their own destiny. Um, does anyone else have uh, any questions? I'm kind of wrapping up here. One question, okay. <clears throat> Uh, so you mentioned that you would prefer to use the command line whenever possible to do something on your computer. So yes. I, was, I was wondering, are there any particular things that command line programs do that just drive you up the wall? And uh, what could developers of command line interfaces do to make them as easy to use as possible for, uh, for blind users like yourself? Hmm. Um. Well, that's what's great about the command line because there's nothing really there to drive up the wall. It's all like plain. It's all text. So I haven't really run into any issues doing stuff on the command line. Um, I mean, but I guess my issue might be I'm having Orca talk way too fast, and I have to make it read it a few times to catch what I'm actually reading. But, but you know, that's why I love the command line. They just, everything gets out of the way. Everything disappears, and uh, you have complete control over what you're trying to do. So I, I can't really say that I've run into an issue doing anything from the command line. Thank you.